cat stopped in the middle of the path and then it stared straight at me. I was terrified. It all bring a tear to my eye thinking about it, just my emotion that I felt that day. I just froze. <laughs> didn't want to move because I didn't want it coming towards me or anything, something like that. You think, where the hell has that come from? Welcome to Big Cat Conversations. We speak directly to people who've encountered one of Britain's big cats. We also discuss the bigger picture. I'm Rick Minter, and thanks for joining me. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Big Cat Conversations. We've had a little break from the schedule, but hopefully the wait for this episode will be worth it. And that's because we've got two encounters to hear about in this edition, the first of which is pretty dramatic, as you'll hear in a minute. And we're back in Cumbria with these reports, following on from last time's episode with Sharon and her family at the Westmoreland Show. Our guest now is Charles from Lancashire, but we're hearing of two incidents when he and his family were caravanning in Cumbria. And these incidents were 21 years apart, as Charles will explain. So let's get started with things. Charles, welcome to the show. How are you? Oh, I'm fine, thanks. And thanks for calling. Great. Well, nice to have you on, Charles. You sent an email introducing yourself, and I thought, that is great. We're going to be in Cumbria soon with an episode anyway. Let's make it two in a row, because this is a very interesting encounter. I know you've had two. The first one, I think, it, you know, stands out, and we'll obviously start with that one in a second. But before we hear about that first one, before it happened, did you ever know anything about big cats possibly being a real thing in Britain? Had you heard any reports or any gossip about it? Yes, I had. Anthea and I, we're walkers that's our main hobby and we spend a lot of time caravanning and we spent a lot of summers quite a few summers in Cornwall and Devon and then I heard about the what was then called the beast of Bodmin so we became aware that there were black cats roaming the countryside and then the second thing that I brought to my attention there was a picture in I think it was the Telegraph and it showed the St. Austell clay pits. And there were two paw marks in the clay pits. One was like a fully grown cat, which was one of these wild cats. And the other was a small paw alongside it. And this story was trying to prove that these wild cats were actually breeding. So, yes, Rick, I was aware of this before I actually encountered one myself. We've had a report from that area of Cornwall, the clay pits. And of course, they're so bright that any dark coloured animal can show up if there's no vegetation as a backdrop. So, um, yes, and they still yield reports today from things like the quarry operator drivers, that sort of thing. And that was back in the 90s, Charles, wasn't it? Because your first incident we're going to hear about now was June 1997, so a long time ago. But could we hear all about it, please? So take us through it, if you could. Yes, okay. Well, like I said, we like the countryside and we like walking. And we had parked the caravan on the outskirts of Sedba. And I directed the awning alongside the caravan. And the particular day that we're speaking of, it was a very, very hot day. So before we set off walking, what I'd done, I'd unzipped the four panels of the awning at the top to let in some airflow to keep the awning cool. And then we set off with a picnic and we were away for most of the day. So on the return, late afternoon, I unzipped the awning and uh, Auntie was right behind me. And when I entered the awning, there was this big black cat in the far corner. It immediately, having been disturbed, started jumping up and down, and I mean leaping up and down. It was leaping to the top of the awning, which is, what, probably about eight feet in height. Anthea, (laughs) my wife, she saw this and she took off. She went away to get a stick because we'd been walking with two friends and uh, Malcolm had a walking stick, and she thought, oops, I need a walking stick to get this animal out. Big black animal with a long tail. We don't want that in the awning. So I 
went into the awning was just one step. And I thought, how's it got in and how's it going to get out? Well, the obvious answer to how's it going to get out is where I was standing because I'd now created a doorway with drawing the awning back. So plan A was to slide down the side of the caravan, hoping that the this animal would instantly see the opening and make its way round the awning and go out back into the fresh air. So plan A was working. I was quietly, very quietly, very slowly, very carefully, very silently sliding down the side of the caravan. And everything was going smoothly. The animal was leaping up and down, constantly leaping up and down, and it was making its way round the awning. Eventually, we were opposite each other. And it was then when I realised how big this animal was. It was a beautiful animal. It was jet black. It was in midair when I was when I was looking at it, examining it. It was in midair coming down, and that's the best picture I had of it. And it was probably about two feet off the ground, horizontal, because you know how animals, cats, they jump up in a vertical position, but halfway down, they sort of twist in midair, and they always land on all the four paws. And this is what was happening. So I, I got this animal, in my view, halfway down, which was in a horizontal position now. Now, the sunlight was coming through the window, and uh, the hairs, at the, the end of the hairs of the this cat were illuminated in a way. It was like a silhouette, beautiful silver silhouette. As I said before, it was jet black, short-haired, it was silent. It never mewed or growled or whatever. Its eyes, you know the cat's eyes that we used to have in the road when before we got all these white lines? Sure, yeah. That's exactly the colour they were. They were the yellowy green colour that you would you would see in the roadway. And they were focused on the opening that I'd created. And it then disappeared. Oh, we're separated by a table, by the way. There's a, a, a two-foot-wide table, and it's about three foot six long. And we were separated by this table. That's the distance. That's how near I was to it. And then it fell behind the table, and I never saw it again. I did not see it make the leap from the mid-distance of the caravan to the opening. It must have made one leap of six to seven feet to get through that opening and get its escape to its freedom. And that was as close as I was to it. It was in beautiful condition. It was about the size of a, of a large Labrador. And I would say that its legs were shorter than a Labrador and more stout, but it was really agile. And it was really in good condition. A very close encounter and a very brief encounter. Everything worked out. Plan A worked. Remarkable. Thank you so much for that very vivid description. And uh, one of the most close-up encounters we'll ever hear. And you'll, you'll no doubt not be surprised at, at that, that you have got as close to one of these animals as anybody would do. How quickly did it realise where it should go to? It got the hint, did it, you think, straight away that it had to go for the light to get to that escape route and it actually you know, achieved that. Is that correct? I would think so, yeah. I would think that animal was wanting to get away from me as much as I wanted it out of my awning. And me not shooing it out or anything like that, just being in the awning with it, but not making any clapping hands or trying to get rid of it. I was very silent, as it was very silent. The two of us respected each other's space. And when it got to a position where it could get through that door, because, as I say, when it was in mid-air, 
those eyes were focused on that doorway. So it knew where it wanted to go, and it went. So its attitude towards you was that it was unnerved by you. You caught it unawares. It was unnerved. It was in no way threatening whatsoever. And and in terms of fight or flight, it was definitely in flight mode. Yes, I would agree with what you're saying there. I mean, I've never been frightened of animals. I was brought up in a, a Yorkshire village, a small Yorkshire village, and rural areas. I mean, I mean, I'm used to animals. During the war, because uh, I lived during the uh, Second World War, I'm that old. <laughs> I mean, the farmers used to just drive the cows right down the main street when they were moving them from one field to another. Or every Thursday, uh, we had the auction mark in the village where the farmers would bring their animals for auction and I would play in the auction mart in the school holidays and the stockman used to tell us you should always face up to the animals and never show that you're frightened. He said never turn your back on them and if you show that they're frightened they will sense it and they will take advantage of that. So face up to the animals and you'll be okay. And so I've never been frightened of animals. In fact, one thing I used to do as a young lad in short pants, we had a car horse in the back field behind the house. And in the evenings, I would encourage it to come over to a low stone wall and climb on the wall and then leap onto the car horse's back, grab all of its mane and go around the field on, on the bareback, on the back of the... Um, with the car horse. So it was considerable size compared to you as a youngster. That's right. But as I say, I, I've never never been frightened of, of uh, my animals. I've always respected them. I've respected their territory. Many a time an animal is defensive. It's not attacking, it's being defensive. I mean, our experience of that, when I was on safari in uh, South Africa and we were going through some wooded area in a, an open topped Land Rover and the guide stopped because a herd of elephants was crossing the road in front of us. He thought they'd all gone past and then he went forward in the Land Rover. He didn't realise that the bull elephant had not crossed the road with the herd and that bull elephant charged us and seriously charged us the ears flapping, the trunk swinging, and, it, and instead of crossing the road itself, it came down the track after us, you know. So circumstances are that if you can upset an animal, then it will be defensive and it may attack. But if you keep calm and uh, you, you respect an animal, then it will usually behave okay. Yeah. Isn't it interesting how all those instincts just kicked in spontaneously because they just had to in that situation for you? Because if anything is ever going to go pear-shaped and somebody's going to get an injury, it is when they're cornered and feel threatened. But of course, you didn't make it feel cornered or threatened. Well, it was physically cornered to some degree, I suppose. Yeah. You kept calm and kept your composure sort of spontaneously, really, I guess. Well... It's inbuilt because I was in the fire service for 30 odd years. And when you arrive at an incident, whether it's a fire, a flood, a road accident, a building collapse, or one thing or another, the one thing you've got to do is simply assess the situation and then act to resolve the situation. And this was probably my fire brigade mode, including my lack of fear of an animal that came in simultaneously. Very fortuitous, really, that you had those skill sets and experience and (laughs) implemented them because you damn well had to. Yeah, I've had many, many incidents that uh, afterwards you've thought, by God, what did I do? What happened there? Why did I do this? Why did I do that? But at the time, you go into your fire brigade mode and you deal with the incident. I guess we'll never know, but what's your hunch about why it was there? You hadn't been having a barbecue outside or inside, had you, and a big meat smell, or was it particularly warm in there on a cooler day or something? Why do you think it was in there? 
There's three things come to mind. First of all, like you're suggesting, food. But in that awning, we had breakfast in there, but all the food was in the caravan. So there was nothing in the awning that would sort of smell so that it would it would encourage the animal to go in thinking there was something there. Unless, of course, like every caravan site in the Dales, you've got rabbits about and they could smell the, the scent of a rabbit, presumably, because that's what they're living off. Mainly, they're living off these rabbits. And what can I say? People may have had a barbecue previously because those sites, people are moving on and off those sites the whole time. So you don't know what has happened a couple of days previously. You don't know whether they've spilt anything and it's been absorbed into the ground. And that has attracted the animal. The other thing is, it was such a hot day. I mean, it's very rare for me to open the tops of the awning to, to ventilate the awning. So it, it's got to be a hot day. It could have been seeking shade. It could have been seeking shade and gone under the caravan. And the third thing is, you know, it could have been curiosity. You know, you talk about curiosity killing the cat, don't you? Oh, yeah. Cats investigate spaces, don't they? Yes, they do. Yeah. So it could have been. I mean, we've no evidence of any of those things at all. There's no visible or no, no evidence as to which it was. It could have been a combination of those things. But we don't have any evidence, so we can't say it was this or it was that. Although cats do explore spaces because they are curious things and they go inside structures, no doubt about it, in old sort of derelict barns and old car wrecks and old caravan wrecks across the countryside, I'm sure they hole up in those sorts of things and people have seen them come out of those things from a distance sometimes. But, of course, in a lot of those old ones that they use, there's no human smells. But, of course, there would have been human smells. You know, it's interesting that it decided to enter the awning and there would have been human smells about. Yeah. It puzzled me initially how it had got in because the awning itself is really well pegged down on three sides. But, of course, the underside of the caravan, there's only a, a loosely pegged down skirt. So it could have easily funneled under that but then couldn't have got back to the way because it was pegged on the inside. A natural funnel was created from under the caravan, but not going to the way. It could slither in, but it couldn't slither out sort of thing. Correct, yeah. You've described it pretty well, Charles, but were there any markings at all from your view? Did you see any rosettes? Say it was a black leopard, which is obviously the strongest candidate for a large black cat like that. Did you see any markings at all on the coat? Not at all, just jet black, short-haired, jet black. The condition of it was beautiful. It was really, really in beautiful condition. Yeah. Okay, and standout features, in terms of its physical features, I don't know, length of tail or shoulder blades, or you've said about the thick legs, but anything else that you'd really remark upon? Muscular, the front end, I concentrated on the front end of it. I mean, Anthea talks about the long tail, but I concentrated on the front of that animal. That's that's the dangerous part of, of that animal. And my vision of that head, looking directly at the opening, beautiful shaped head, muscular. Yeah, you talked about the shoulders. You mentioned the shoulders there. It had muscles. It really did have a muscular physique. It was a strong animal. It was. Okay. And you mentioned the eyes and the colour. Was there sun coming through to sort of illuminate them a bit and make them shine a bit? Or was it just the natural colour that you just happened to see because it was so close? It was so close. When I was describing the sunlight coming through the window, the hairs, they were just sort of white at the tips, but not because... They were white. It was white because the sunlight was catching them. And it, it was a silhouette. It was a silhouette. Beautiful. I mean, afterwards, I admired the animal. It was such a beautiful animal. It was almost like a pet. Yeah, they've got a silvery sheen. Yes. It was highlighted with that. Yeah, it was highlighted with that, yeah. Yeah, so your wife noticed the long tail. Yeah, oh, yeah, she's wiser than me. <laughs> So did she see it when it exited and when it fled away? No, no, no. She was still uh, seeking the walking stick. 
it had all gone. By the time she came back, I mean, we're talking about less than a minute from beginning to end, I should imagine, this encounter. You know, I would I would say 60 seconds was a, a long time. At that distance, certainly. Yeah, yeah. So you don't know what happened. You don't know precisely what happened after it left the awning. No, I know nothing about that once it left. Uh, nobody else saw it. I did go to the uh, site owner and mention it, you know, because he would certainly want to know. But I think they were a little bit apprehensive about uh, customers and clients coming with their young children or animals and one thing or another. And if they'd announced that there was a black cat roaming the area, then uh, the clients may have made a quick exit sort of thing. I mean, I've dealt with reports on campsites before, and uh, you have to have some very tentative, cautious discussions with the owners. When you mentioned it to him, did you feel he knew about reports in the area, or did he say anything much, or was he just guarded? He wanted me to leave the office. (laughs) I think perhaps he knew. Other people knew about it. I mean, I was contacted once it got into the press. I was contacted by a young lady called Miss Fairburn, and she said, oh, I've seen that black cat. I know the one that you've seen. I go walk in that area. She had a cottage in the area, and she said, I've seen it when I've been walking. And she said, the last time I saw it, it leapt up onto a boulder. She said, and it's long black tail, and the size of the animal she knew straight away it wanted domestic animals. She was probably about 50 feet away, 50 yards away from it. She said she'd stopped talking to a friend. She was on a path and someone had come the other way and they'd stopped to talk when she saw this cat come out of the long grass and sit on this boulder. She said there was a farm nearby and the farm dogs were howling. She said they'd never done that before. I know this area very well. I walk here regularly and those dogs have never responded the same way as they were responding that particular day when that cat was up on that boulder. They probably sensed it and and they were howling. She said, and also the farmer, a little bit further upstream, the, the, the caravan site is very near a river and the farmer has the fishing rights or he had in those days and he used to sell day licenses. And whenever someone came, He always warned them of the black cat which was roaming around the area. So there was two other sightings that I'm aware of in that area of a big black cat. So I'm sure the site owner knew about it, but didn't want to know. Very awkward for them, yeah. Yes, yes. I know there's a snippet on this, a news item in the Westmoreland Gazette, the local newspaper for that part of Cumbria, at the time, and we'll reproduce that, put a copy of that on the website for this edition on references and links under episode 102. So thank you for that. And of course, right at the end, I think that mentions a snippet about the lady you're talking about who saw it. I'm not sure if that's the right lady. I'm not sure about that. Uh, Somebody else then? Yeah, possibly. Yeah, yes, I think maybe, because they're talking about Witherslack, the sightings in Witherslack which is quite a few, as you know, it's quite a few miles away from where we saw that. I wrote that name on simply because that was the way you contacted me. I tried to take a photo of the claw mark that was in the window of the awning, and I couldn't. I couldn't do it. So she suggested if I take it along to her factory, she'll put it on an industrial photocopier. And we'll try and get uh, some pictures off there. And that's exactly what happened. I went to her works and we took some copies of the uh, the claw mark in the window. That's how I managed to, to get the photo. Thank you for sending me that. And again, with your permission, we'll put that on the references and links part of the website for Big Cat Conversation so people can see it. And it's basically got, I would say, one very distinct notch mark and one... One big striation and one small striation, but you can definitely see the yes. needle-like aspect to those. So very precise and very compelling. So very interesting backup to what you're saying. It penetrated the awning there. <laughs> this, this is a funny thing. 
I decided that I would have to claim on the insurance, you see, because water was coming in, you see. So I, first of all, decided that all I needed was a replacement of one panel in the awning. So I contacted the manufacturers and I said, could you send me a replacement panel? Why? So I had to tell them this story. Now, Rick, you t- <laughs> t- it's like telling someone that, about the man in the moon in the 1930s. You know, it, it just didn't happen. It was entertaining. They hardly believed me, you know. Yeah, but yeah. ultimately they said, no, we cannot supply you with a panel. You'll have to have the complete awning. We don't do separate panels. So I said, okay. So I then rang the insurance company and I had to tell them the story. Again, I'm on the phone for a long time. I mean, to repeat myself and convince them that that's what had happened. And then they said, oh, we're going to put a, an assessor on, an insurance assessor. He will contact you, you see. Yeah, I think they had some doubt about this story. So he contacted me, and again, I had to tell my story, and I was on the phone a long time again, repeating myself, and he said, okay, I'll get back to you. I think you're you're telling the truth. He said, but I'll get back to you. Several weeks passed before he did get back to me, and when he did, he said, will you tell me the story again? So I repeated the story, and he said, right, yes, I agree. I'm going to accept your claim. I'm going to tell the insurance company it's a genuine claim. But tell me, under what clause are you claiming? Because it's not storm damage, it's not vandalism, it's not this, it's not that. He said, what clause are you claiming on? I said, I'm claiming on the fact that I pay the insurance company £200 a year, that if anything happens to my caravan or awning, I'm covered <laughs> for, for a claim, for a rebate. <laughs> so he said... Yes, that's a very good answer. I'll put it forward to them and I'll suggest that they pay the claim. And you got it, did you? I got it, yes. Oh, yes, I, yeah. Excellent. And I, I think listeners like me would have noticed the unintended pun. What clause are you claiming under? <laughs> not deliberate. I'm not that clever. <laughs> <laughs> Pleased to pick that one up. Well done. What a neat, uh, uh, what a neat little finale that you actually got an insurance claim based on a Black Panther in Britain. They obviously had a doubt. <laughs> yeah, of, of course. Well done for sticking to your guns, and good for him for being positive about it. Now, yes, yes. Before we move on on this particular case, how would you describe your emotions? You've said you kept calm, you kept composed. So, on reflection. Just immediately afterwards, in the next few hours after this had happened, what were your emotions reflecting on it? You know, how did you feel? Yeah. Um, now then, that's difficult because I wondered what would happen if I'd have gone into that situation and shooed the animal out. I think the animal would have responded differently. I mean, had it been a small cat when I went into the awning, or a squirrel or something like that, I would have gone in, shooing it out, clapping my hands and trying to get rid of it. But because it was the bigger animal, then I was very cautious, as I've described earlier. I thought at one time, what the heck am I doing here? That was when it was opposite me in this horizontal position. (laughs) And I could then see the full size of it. And that was an emotion. I thought, why am I here? What have I done? What the heck is it could have happened? But it was all over with. I mean, the morning after we went walking, Andrew and I, and we saw a domestic cat and we started laughing, you know, because of the size of this domestic cat compared with the animal that we'd uh, been so close to the evening before. I was glad it was all over with. I didn't feel sort of trembly or ill about it or anything like that. I I felt quite confident that I'd done the right thing and got rid of it. Did it give you any kind of bond with the animal that you'd spent that time 
coexisting with it in a very uh, heart-stopping moment. I mean, often people do say that even if they feel threatened, that they feel that close association they've had, all bit for a fleeting moment, you know, that there's something powerful about that bond that you had at that moment that lives on. Did you have any kind of, you know, that kind of reaction? Definitely, definitely. I thought, what a magnificent animal, what a beautiful animal. I could have put a leash on it and taken it home. <laughs> it, it was really, really, I, I admired it. You know, I did. It was such a, it had kept itself in good condition no matter what it was eating or where it was living. It was looking after itself as an animal. And uh, yeah, I could have taken it home and had it as a pet, definitely. Yeah, well, it's interesting you can vouch for the good condition because so many witnesses say that, albeit at a further distance. But, I mean, it is intriguing how, I mean, what good nick they appear to be. And you can vouch for that so close. And so, in, in yes. a way, you know, a wild animal doing its stuff in Cumbria. And, and we're talking about southeast Cumbria, aren't we? Just a little bit east of Kendal. So, in fact, not far from where we were at the Westmoreland Show in the last episode, which is in the southeast Cumbria. That's right, isn't it, the location? Yeah, the, the show was just further up the road from where we saw this animal. Yeah. I mean, my memory took a photograph of that animal. It did, in, in, in mid-air, when it, was, when it was horizontally in front of me. I mean... The weight of it, as it was going round, it knocked over some crates that I had in the awning, and it also knocked off, knocked over a full-size chair. We had the lounges. You know the lounges that you can recline, you can lay on them, or you can use them as a, a chair up to a table. Yeah. Very substantial chair. When it came down, it hit that chair and knocked it sideways onto the ground. So it, the weight of the animal was just was. Uh, verified by what it was uh, doing its impacts yes its impacts yeah 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 and you can quite understand how they're capable of predating an adult deer yes this was capable definitely i mean uh, i spoke to um, professor kitchener at edinburgh university edinburgh museum yeah dr andrew kitchener at, at uh, edinburgh museum Oh, is he at the museum? Sorry. Yeah. Um, but I did, I did get in touch with him. I rang Blackpool Zoo about this incident, and they put me on to Andrew Kitchener, and he said they were living off rabbits. And I thought, well, that's a, a small meal for this animal. It, it probably wants more than one rabbit because it, was, it looked to be a hungry cat. Yes, but he meant that you know, there's natural game. There's enough natural game, including rabbits, for them in our countryside, I guess. Yes, yes. This was capable of bringing down a young deer, no doubt about it. Yes, and of course, very interesting you spoke to Andrew Kitchener. He really is a, a guru. Wrote a book on, a very good book on uh, wild cats of the world. Specialises in European wild cats, Scottish wild cat. So you had a good chat with him then? Yeah, I did, yes. He said that I should have zipped it up and I'd have been a very wealthy man. He said, of getting rid of it, I should have enclosed it. <laughs> he said, you'd have been a very wealthy man. He also asked, he said, were there any hairs left, you know, in the awning? Good point. He was interested in getting the DNA, something like that. But you see, the point was, we, did, we didn't go home. After we left uh, Sedba, we went down to South Wales to Randy Moyne. And after that, we went into the Tidville area and the Brecon Beacons, in fact. And we did some walking in the Brecon Beacons before we came home. So we were away about a month altogether from home. By the time we'd put the awning up and taken it down, there was no trace of any hairs at all. But he was hoping that there might be some hairs stuck in the canvas, but there wasn't, just the claw mark. Well, thank you for that. I think that's, you know, that's covered that one. Uh, well, for, I suppose final point about that one is, is it's a really close encounter. And if, if it isn't true, you're lying, basically. <laughs> It's not one where the witness could be misciting and have got a dog or a cat at the wrong scale or a different animal. Uh, so have you told this to some people and they've simply refused to believe you, Charles? I haven't often spoken about it. I mean, it would only be really close friends and they accept what I say, really, so they've, they've certainly believed me. I mean, the family pull your leg, don't they, of course, and they have some jokes with you. Expect that, don't you? Be worried yeah. if that didn't yeah. happen to some extent. Yeah. yeah. 
they believe my wife anyway if they don't believe me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the close encounter ones that, that are really close are important for people to realise that this is either truth or lie. You can't make a mistake at, at that proximity, so that's the value of them. No, 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 no. no Good no. stuff. And I say it, it, it was probably with the four poles extended and the hind legs extended, it would take up the length of that table that uh, was in the awning. So but I measured it the other day, and it's three foot six. Is that the length of the table? So it was a, it was a big gap. Very good, very good. And now the next one, 21 years later. In that 21 years, were you looking out for them at all? Were you thinking, well, you know, I've had this amazing encounter. I wonder if I'll see another one. Did that, Or did you just think it was a once-in-a-lifetime experience and move on? Or The latter, once-in-a-lifetime. I never thought I'd ever see another one. Yeah. But then it happened 2018, I guess it would have been then. Between Kendall and Windermere, the caravan site on the left-hand side of the road as you're travelling north from Kendal to Windermere. So that's the location of it. Within Cumbria, we're still fairly southeast. then within Cumbria. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. Certainly south. OK, well, t- again, take us through what happened, if you could. OK. So Anthony and I were caravanning on the caravan site near the village of Stavely. And we left the caravan site, walking towards the main road. And in the field before the main road, we were on the footpath with a hedge on our right-hand side. Then the hedge gave way to a low stone wall so we could see into the adjacent field. And in the hedge of this adjacent field, there was this black cat, large black cat. And it had been laid in the sun in the hedge. As soon as it saw us, it stood up and it looked at us and it never took its eyes off us. (laughs) It was really staring at us. I put my rucksack on the stone wall with the thought of getting my camera out. I unzipped the rucksack, delved into the bottom of the rucksack to find the camera. Meanwhile, the cat is making its way up a slight incline, keeping close to the hedge. By the time I got my camera out, which was then in another case, and I had to get it out of the other case, and I was setting the camera up, and it had gone over the top of the hill. So it was a very brief encounter. Uh, It was at about 50 yards distance, finishing up about 100 yards distance as it walked away from us. The animal itself was not of the same stature as the one I saw previously. I would say it was a younger animal. Still black. There was no other markings on it other black. I mean, from 50 yards, you can, if there was any markings, they would be very small. But I reckon it was jet black like the other one, short-haired, and uh, it kept its eye on us more or less all, all the way up the hedge side. And it, it didn't run. It just sort of ambled. It wasn't frightened of us in a way. It didn't want to run away from us. There are no properties within a quarter of a mile of where we sighted this animal. That's trying to rule out that it could have been a pet from a nearby dwelling. And having seen one before, I certainly recognised it immediately again. Yeah. How did you gauge the scale? Hmm. It's slighter, thinner, slightly longer legged, I would think, than the other one. How was it apparent that it was a large cat? Was it obviously just the makeup of it, or did you were you able to see it against the wall or whatever? Well, I mean, from fifty yards, you can tell the difference between a domestic cat and something which is about four or five times bigger than a domestic cat. So, if we're going to give a dimension, I'd say it was four or five times the size of, of a big domestic cat. You could tell, again, by the thickness of his legs. Even at that distance, you could tell it had thick legs. Did you get a good view of the tail? Looking at its head more than anything else, but it did have a long tail, yeah. And you both saw it again. So both cases, both yourself and your wife, had the sighting, which helps, doesn't it? 
Oh, that's right. Yeah, she knew straight away that it was similar to the other one. And again, I went to the caravan site and I just asked there if anyone had reported seeing a, a large black cat in the, the area. And she said, as far as I know, she said, no, nobody's reported it and nobody's seen it. But you see, the staff there, it's not a private site, it's a, a caravan and camping club site. So they change the assistance all the time. They're not a constant presence. So you don't know whether there have been any reported sightings going back that they were aware of? There's no record of it at all, no, no. So you reckon you perhaps disturbed it when it was sunning itself in the morning sun? This was morning time, wasn't it? Yes, it was It was probably about 10 o'clock in the morning and the sun was, was shining. Uh, it was a nice day and it was resting. We, we saw it rise. I mean, that, that's what attracted us to it. it. It sort of got up once we came to this low wall and it could see us and we could see it. It automatically just rose from the ground and then started walking slowly up the hedge side. It didn't make any movement, sudden movement at all. It was just stealthily walking up the hedge side. And it's interesting that you wanted to get your phone out, your phone camera out of your rucksack and didn't manage it in time. But to what extent do you think seeing one before primed you for that because sometimes quite often people don't get even think to get their camera phone out because they're processing it assuming it's a black labrador or something but you realized pretty instantly what it was did you perhaps because of the previous experience well between the the two sightings i had then seen other photographs on the television or in the newspaper of other people up and down the country that had got photographs of a black cat. And I thought, if I ever see one again, I'll take a picture of it, although I didn't ever think I would see one again. So that was in my mind, and I thought I'll record this because it will be evidence then. It will be proof that I've seen one. But I, I wasn't quick enough. That's interesting that you were disciplined, you know, wanting to do that if you ever get another chance. But it might still have been the case that for the, for a few seconds you didn't realise what it was, but you realised instantly, did you, what it was? Oh, yes. As soon as it stood up, I knew what it was. Yeah, yeah, there's no doubt about it. The camera, unfortunately, it was at the bottom of my rucksack. There was a, sandwiches and things for lunch on top of that, so it was a bit of rustling. And I was trying to look at the animal and feel for the camera at the same time. You must have felt chuffed to see one again, did you, to reinforce the, the previous experience? I was thinking that I might be sort of unique in having seen two different wildcats, yeah, wild animals, yeah. Some people have seen both the black one and the puma, the tan-coloured type that gets reported as well. Few lucky people, call it lucky if you want, have had more than one encounter, and sometimes, you know, the two different types, so... And you guys obviously do a lot of walking, so you'd be, you'd have the chance, I guess, and you're fairly observant. Because actually, a lot of people who, who go sort of rambling type walking, I often think they're not actually that alert. They're often using a, a walk as a backdrop to talking with friends or the family, or and they're not sort of looking for tracks and animal signs and alert to smells and other natural things happening in the countryside. But if you do it enough, I guess you've got the chance of seeing things. Yes, I mean, we've done walks. I mean, I'm talking about the Southwest Coastal Path, which is 600 miles long. We've done that. We've climbed every Wainwright Peak in the Lake District. Uh, we've done the Dales Way and walks. We've even been to uh, Nepal and done trekking in the Annapurna Range in Paul. So we are keen walkers. And at your age, you're an advert for that, aren't you? You still get out, Charles, do you, and do walking? Well, unfortunately, since we turned 80, we've had to slow down. Anthea has now got osteoporosis, ah. so um, her walking distance is limited. I sometimes go out occasionally, very rarely, but I do now go out and do walks by myself. But uh, I usually stay at home and do the garden now, that sort of thing, keeping fit. Good for body and soul in all sorts of ways, a life of walking and being alert in the outdoors. Yeah, what we're enjoying now is when we've been on trips and one th caravanning and, and, and abroad, 
I've taken a camera with me, going back to cine cameras before uh, they came out with the video cameras that they've got nowadays. And I've recorded all our trips abroad and, and parties and things. And we now relax on a rainy day. We, there's nothing better than just putting a DVD on. Because I've transferred all the cine onto DVD, oh, yeah. VHS tapes. I've transferred the VHS tapes as well onto, onto DVDs. And uh, we can sit there, you know, and we say, oh, let's go to Cornwall today or let's go to Scotland, whatever. And, and we, we really love reminiscing on where we've been. It recorded, like Wainwright did. I mean, Wainwright wrote his books so that in his old age he could uh, enjoy them all again if he was only reading about them. Very good. Yeah, relive the memories while you can. There must be all kinds of highlights from your walks and trips, but they must stand out. You've been in the media, you've now on this podcast. It's a memorable landmark event, isn't it? Something like that in your life. Yes, they, they're outstanding. I mean, I can tell fire brigade stories as well of incidents that I've uh, experienced in the fire service. In 30 years, you've got stories to tell there. But uh, yes, sighting the, uh, these big black cats is near the top. Yeah, certainly near the top 10. Yeah. How does it make you feel? I mean, obviously pick things up in the media that it's an ongoing issue that people report them and get in the media and... What's your attitude to big cats being in the wild in Britain and possibly naturalising? Have you got a sort of emotional view? Do you think it's good or worrying or interesting or, or what? First of all, these cats have, not, have had no choice, have they? They've been turned out by their previous owners and they've had to fend for themselves and they're surviving. Apparently they're breeding, they must be breeding. So, well done to the animals. They keep themselves to themselves, looking after themselves, aren't they? And they're not attacking people. You hear occasionally that they've attacked a sheep or something. That's not always been proved to be the case, because we know that dogs can also attack sheep. So I think well done to the animal for surviving. And I think if they've got pride, then they should be proud of themselves. OK, so you see it as positive. You wouldn't want them eliminated or tracked down or you, you feel that they've earned their right to be respected in the countryside? Absolutely. They're part of our countryside now. I mean, people are talking about all sorts of animals being set free now. Are they talking about lynxes being set free? Reintroduced, yeah, the former native lynx. Yeah, reintroduced, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, they could be free. Then certainly these big black Cats can be free. I think they'll keep away from humans. I think they'll keep themselves to themselves. They've been with us for a long, long time now, and there's no record of a human being having been harmed with these wild cats, so best of luck to them. Are you surprised, Charles, that we are so slow to get better hard evidence i mean like andrew kitchener asked you you know any hairs in caught in the snagged in the awning which is a great point things like that we don't often get the hard evidence to back all of this up you had your first sighting decades ago literally and yet there isn't much hard evidence about still no the, the only evidence i've got of course is the claw mark in the awning which is good the photo would be great to show on the website so that is an interesting snippet so that's a good point and uh, I was just wondering if any DNA could be taken from a claw <laughs> mark at all. I don't, I don't know how good they are with DNA. No, it would have to be a bit of the body, like a sheath of the claw, for example. If it had that snagged in one of those notch marks, then yeah, that because that's like skin, so you get the DNA from that. So it's either a physical part of the body or a excretion from the body, like a a urine spray or a bit of the poo or a hair or a whisker, something like that. So frustrating. But when you had that first sighting, did you think by now, you know, decades on, we'd have some better evidence? Perhaps the thought didn't occur to you, but it is interesting, isn't it, that we, we struggle to get the hard evidence, um, despite many sightings and some close-up sightings. It's just the hard evidence is so challenging to get. I think... Sometimes, if there is a regular sighting of an animal, that 
I'm surprised that nobody puts up these cameras that operate once there's a movement nearby. I'm afraid I, I do and uh, spend too much money on it at times, you know, putting plenty out. And I've had a couple of tails and I've had one half decent one and one or two other people have. So we make very slow progress on that. And I think it's partly because their territories in Britain are perhaps looser than they would be in their native countries. In the native countries, there's more of them. So they're a bit more sort of crowded in by their neighbours. And so a territory means something. So they repeat the same routes. And you'd expect them to once in a while repeat the route that you put your camera on. Well, that doesn't seem to be happening here so much. And I think that is one part of the challenge, to be honest. But it is, you're right, it is the best way. I think one of the ways that we're aware of that we need to keep trying. And I think if we keep persisting, we'll get some more of those eventually. The one thing I thought about in the second sighting, at the road where the, the path that goes across the road, there's also an underpass. So the farmer takes his cattle from one field to another field through this underpass, but it was well overgrown. And I was thinking that was the perfect den or lair for one of these animals. And maybe we could find likely spots where they would make a den or a lair, but they seem to be nomadic, don't they? They don't seem to stop in the same area for long. That's correct. But of course, what you're saying about finding the layup spots or the den sites or the layers, yeah, that is absolutely fundamental and what we struggle to do because putting your cameras near those, of course, would give you the best chance. Yeah. You're dead right. But the other thing is the underpasses are, of course, pinch points potentially. They're the absolute funnel, a physical funnel where mammals have to go. If you've only got a few of these camera traps, the trail cameras, then you've got to put them in an intelligent position rather than just, you know, needle in a haystack situation. So you've got to think, well, where are these bottlenecks and funnels that they've almost physically got to go through? And so like an underpass on a road crossing is one such position. So, yeah, if, if you get the landowner permission and can work with the landowners to do that, that could be a good position, certainly. Yeah, yeah. It's clever thinking plus landowner help and support that's going to get us to the cameras working in those kinds of situations. So you're in the, the media, in the Westmoreland Gazette at the time, and it's a very helpful report, which we'll reproduce. Did you do any, any other media work on this as a result of the case? No, no, I didn't. I very rarely spoke about it, really. It's nice to catch up and reflect on it now because we can put it in the podcast series and we've just had a whole episode from Cumbria. This is more of the same, but with that historical interest. One thing I did, Rick, I went on, there was a website and I put my story on that website, but I didn't get any reply, no response at all. With not getting any response from that, I then thought, well, I've, I've tried, you know, and... Uh, I'll leave it alone now. All this time, what have you been referring to these as panthers or...? Uh, yeah, black panther. Yeah, I've called it a black panther, yeah. I noted in the, the headline in the Westmoreland Gazette was to do with a puma, but that wasn't from me. That was from previous sightings up at Witherslack that they got this puma headline. Until I listened to your podcast on Derbyshire, I didn't even know that there was any tanned ones about at all. That's the first time I'd heard about uh, a different coloured cat. About 20% they match the mountain lion, the sandy brown tan coloured one from the Americas, which of course is so similar in scale and behaviour and form and stealth to the black panther or black leopard. I remember once going down the... Uh... It is Highway 101 in America, down, down the Californian coast. Oh, yeah. We were just driving down there, and we wanted a picnic. So we saw a nice little green patch, which was suitable for was parking, and we pulled up, and we got all our picnic stuff out, and we just sat there looking at the, as they call it, the ocean. And uh, I just looked at this notice board, and it says, Beware of mountain lions. <laughs> You should have seen us move. <laughs> oh, the picnic went into the blanket and thrown in the back of the car and away. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, I, I guess that does cue up another point. Then 
you know, how do we raise awareness of these big cats being around in Britain? Because what would you have felt about seeing a, a similar sign in the Lake District when you were doing your walking there that, at those times, you know, saying beware of black leopards? You know, black leopards reported here last week at 10 o'clock in the morning. That's the same, really, isn't it? We have these cats reported very faithfully by people, yet we don't have those kinds of signs. What would you think of those kinds of signs being present in Britain? Well, all I can say about that is that when you go in Scotland and you see these signs that says, beware of adders, then my children will, never, <laughs> will not go anywhere near <laughs> that area at all, you see. So I think beware of means keep away, in my mind. It's too stern, it's too severe, it's too worrying for people, you think? Yes, oh, definitely, definitely, yes. The psychology of the wording of a sign, the tactics of the wording of a sign is important, isn't it? Because we don't want to put people off enjoying the countryside and having the mental and physical health benefits from walking and enjoying the countryside. That is the problem with some sign warning signs or information signs, I like to call them. Yeah. Say we had some for big cats, you know, in some places. Would you be against that or concerned that that was a bit over the top and too alarmist? Or do you think if they were cautiously done, it would be... A relevant thing to do? Oh no, I don't. I don't think we should, because these animals have got a good reputation in my mind. I don't think we should be, be beware of them. I think if they're aware of us, they will go elsewhere. So I don't think we need the signs. No. Fair enough. They're working around us, and it may be to draw attention to them too much. The signs could be counterproductive, perhaps. You might get people hunting them. You know, you might get people coming. Out with guns and like they do with the wild boar and things. and I wouldn't want the signs, no. Signs do have consequences that we sometimes don't realise, so I think that's a good point. Well, anything else you'd like to say, Charles, before we sign off? No, I'm very pleased that uh, you've called me tonight and I've been able to contribute. I hope that it's a success. Look forward to listening to it in, uh, in November. Although I won't be in this country then, I'll be, I'll be out in Portugal then. In the sunshine. Oh, lovely. Lucky so and so. <laughs> well, we'll send it to you on a link. You can maybe listen to it in Portugal. We do have listeners across yes. the world. So, Oh, that's good. Yes, I'd like that. Well, it's so heartening that you can reflect on it years later and, and you know, put it into the bigger picture of the big cats of Cumbria and the big cats of Britain. So delighted that we could fit such an intriguing encounter. Well, both intriguing, but the first one, as you know, pretty special. Yeah, oh, yeah. Always remember that, yeah. Thanks ever so much for coming on Big Cat Conversations. OK, thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. OK, just to clarify something I discussed with Charles after the mics were off, because he wanted to emphasise that in no way would he have wanted to actually tame and have the cornered panther on a leash. He was simply expressing what a beautiful animal it was and how dignified it was as it tried to think about its escape. I think we all took his comments in that way and in that spirit, but he did want to stress that he didn't mean keep it as a pet, literally. So, staying in Cumbria, we have our word of the week, which is Katsikam. Now, Katsikam is the name of one of the peaks or fells in the Lake District, and it's fairly close to the much better known Helvellyn. Katsikam means the steep path frequented by wildcats, and it comes from Old English and Norse, and so it is an indication of a time when the European wildcat, what we now call the Scottish wildcat, was more widespread across Britain and would have been part of the wildlife in Cumbria. On the website we've put a web link to photos of a walk or stages of a progression of a walk up to the top of Katsikam so you can see the peak and the views from it. Those photos are taken from a website for the Wainwright Walks and Charles mentioned he and his wife have ascended all the Wainwright peaks in the Lake District which was celebrated and written about by the late Alfred Wainwright in his seven sketchbook guides to walking the Lakeland Fells. In those photos you can see the final ascent up Katsikam and it's called the Wildcat Ladder. 
And those photos do show the dramatic, rugged scenery of the Lake District, but they also illustrate what a barren landscape much of those uplands are, with little value to wildlife, unfortunately. And that's one of the reasons why, in Britain, we have a live debate on rewilding, the importance of getting nature back into the landscape, and still keep farmers as custodians with their livelihoods. Perhaps more nature-friendly upland landscapes would have more native woodland regenerating in them, and that would be to the liking of the big cats which have found those areas, and they would predate more deer at those woodland edges, and the sheep kills that we discussed in the last episode would lessen. So you can see those photos on the website under episode 102 on the references and links part of Big Cat Conversations. While we're mentioning the website, if you've not seen them and you want to watch them, you can find videos of the 100th episode pub recording, along with the gentle woodland walk we did the following morning with some of the guests. So those are linked under episode 100 on the refs and links part of the Big Cat Conversations website. For our next episode, we'll be hearing about a long-running saga of big cats seen around as stables in Essex. And it's a case I've had some involvement in over the years, so we'll hear about life on the front line managing horses while big cats pass by and cause issues at times. We're likely to produce new episodes at around three-week intervals over the next year, so sorry we won't be quite as busy as we've been in the past. If you'd like to be part of the show with an encounter you've had, or you have any suggestions, please do get in touch and email me at rick at bigcatconversations.com. There's been a few more very kind reviews for Big Cat Conversations on the Apple Podcast Review System recently, so thanks so much for those. We really appreciate them, and it helps the profile of this show. So, we're signing off now. So, as ever, thanks for listening, thanks for your support for the show, and look forward to being back with you next time. Take care, and bye for now.